So would you please uh, join with me in welcoming Mark Clutch. Thanks, uh, Matt. That was very kind and generous. And hello, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be in Brisbane for a whole bunch of reasons. Number one, this is actually my fifth time to Australia. And uh, <clears throat> I, I picked this picture deliberately because my wife said, uh, where are you? Because she looked at my calendar. She says, you're not home for two and a half weeks. <laughs> where are you going? And I said, I'm going to visit my cousins. <laughs> in Australia, and it does feel like that now, as uh, many of you know, and I've said in a couple other talks so far, that it's spooky how similar the experiences are on many issues, whether it be uh, because of demographics, three levels of government, uh, history, settler, immigrant, uh, indigenous, etc. So there, there's so many dynamics that uh, I do feel like I'm continuing the conversation that we have about these things in Canada, but I'm also hypersensitive to the fact that things are different here, and uh, I'm always on my toes when I share things because I think they're relevant to us, but I, I'm not entirely certain they're always relevant to you, and I enjoy that part of the exchange. Uh, I'm also uh, <clears throat> keen to be here partly because I studied urban and regional planning, and I, and I never practice anything, but I love cities, and I haven't been to Brisbane yet, and it's going to be torture going to the airport because I mostly just want to hang out and drive around and feel what this place is like. It really is quite good looking. Uh, Leanne emailed me this morning and I said, you know, when you eat something really sweet and your taste buds hurt, it's so sweet and that sort of feels what Brisbane, Brisbane feels like to me. So I, it's really quite a nice city. Uh, and I also have heard a lot about Logan and as I mentioned to the gang this morning, uh, not only did I hear about it and know something was going on, uh, clearly after this morning's chat, I'm convinced that uh, well, some collective impact efforts might have emerged in Canada a little bit earlier, partly because of the proximity to the, to the U.S. Uh, Logan is a real player and has clearly leapfrogged a lot of the Canadian examples in terms of what it's set up to do. So uh, as much as I'd like to share, I'm also uh, pleased to share. I'm also here to learn. So I'm, uh, oh, actually, where's my, I probably can just do this, huh? I, uh, we, we could have talked about a lot of things today and decided to talk about these three things uh, after some backing and forthing uh, with, with the gang, knowing that these were the, the topics that you found might have been worth the highest and best use of our conversation time. And I want to also know that there's a PowerPoint, but you have it on, we're going to PDF it and send it out to you. So those of you that want to take pictures, please do, but you'll also have all of this. And uh, these three themes are they may not be counterintuitive when we go through them, but they are countercultural uh, to the way we do our work. Uh, someone said, you know, we really started paying attention to place-based initiatives to tackle complex issues in the last 30 or 40 years. And my immediate response is, no, we, for ever since the beginning of time, we've been doing place-based responses to complex issues. And because of recent centralization and creating bigger systems, we've forgotten in some ways how to do that. So it's not entirely new. I think it's a grand act of remembering that the best chances for uh, tapping some of these things are clearly when you put them in place. But I want to talk a little bit more about that in terms of the why, uh, because as the thesis goes in our last paper uh, around collective impact, the why of this work is abundantly clear, and we have no more time or energy to keep describing why we're doing it. That, that we, that it's not productive. It's the how that we're struggling with. Why place plate based is clear, the how is not, and it does have implications for how we value it. So what we're going to do is I'll do a little bit more intro, I'm going to ask you to chat a little bit, and then I'm going to go through these three themes and then ask you to reflect on it in in small conversations and then we'll open it up for QA. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Who secretly thinks this may be the best hour and a half of their life coming up? <laughs> <laughs> it, it won't be, but it'll be. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit before we go, and then I'll get in a chat. I want to uh, confirm that I, I have, uh, I do like thinking about this, but I mostly like being a practitioner, quite frankly. I, my best job ever was a job from 1997 to the year 2000 as the coordinator of the Opportunities 2000 initiative, uh, which was to reduce poverty to the lowest level in Canada in a region, in a region that already had the second most level of poverty. And the reason I came about was because of evaluation, and I was the evaluator of a nonprofit organization called CODA, the Community Opportunities Development Association. And CODA what we, is what we would now call, and they certainly do in the United States, a community development corporation. So we had, we were focused on employment development, 
creating microenterprises, going into downsizing factories, helping people start jobs, creating social enterprises for training, uh, employment development and community development in communities. We did a lot of it. And I had just come back from Europe and was waiting for my wife to hurry up and marry me because she was being very stubborn about it, so I had to kill some time. And I thought I would do this evaluation. And the evaluation uh, used something called a jury assessment. Energy. You, you've done things like this a little bit, but the jury assessment was we actually created a, like a, a, a court proceeding. We had people coming in and arguing with evidence. Here's why CODA was overall an effective organization and generated a good cost benefit. We had other people coming in saying that's not the case at all. And it's a bit of theater, quite frankly, because what you're doing is really getting people to amplify and distill their arguments. And I wouldn't recommend it as something you do because it's quite tricky to run. We made lots of bobos. But the uh, the final assessment after the second day was terrific because they came out, uh, the jury, and it was 12 people, biblical, 12 people, uh, US, Canada, and some uh, some palms, some folks from Britain, and they said, in, in some editorialized fashion, we think you're one of the best community development organizations around. Your programmatic results are off the charts. You benchmark well against everyone else. The data shows that you are making some mistakes and the things you want to improve, but you really do generate good outcomes for what it is you do. But we don't. We think you're doing things right, but we think you're having a metaphysical crisis and don't believe you're doing the right things. And in particular, we think two things have shifted in your DNA. The first one is you really want to deal with poverty, not employment. And you've kind of learned over time that simply getting employment doesn't address poverty because there's a certain level of employment and income that's necessary, and poverty is more multidimensional than employment. Number two, we think you, when you peel away the onion a little bit, you really want to move the needle on poverty in this entire region. And they came up with a version of the phrase that we, we perfected much later on, which was, Programmatic interventions help people beat the odds. Changing community systems changes the odds for people. And we think you want to move needles, and your current format is not enough to do it. Programs and good organizations are necessary to help the communities. They are not sufficient by themselves to move needles. And that was prophetic because uh, the executive director of the, the organization at the time uh, said, you're absolutely right, and they, they merged the organization with a much larger service delivery group, and we created something called OP2000. It was 1996, getting ready for 1997, a millennial goal. Let's have a four-year sprint, a four-year campaign to get to the lowest level of poverty in Canada, using what we would now call is a collective impact approach, and we didn't have that language back then. Uh, Multi-sectoral uh, innovation, working in place, and thinking about moving needles, not just programmatic outcomes, can we move needles? I have to say that it was almost an entirely different initiative because an hour and a half before we put the proposal out to go to, to our philanthropists, and many of you have been in those situations where the photocopying room is like 150 degrees, you can smell the fluid, etc. people are panicking to get it into the mail at the time, this was before email, and you could send stuff by email. And I looked through the document and I found out that we were asking for $3 million for Canada's first poetry reduction. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of got nervous and I started flipping through the document. Someone had done correct all on poetry and I went, oh my God, we've got statistics of people living in deep poetry. We've got case studies of people living in deep poetry. And our big, our big vision is if we could just reduce poetry and water the region, what a great place this would be. So we corrected one little letter, created a different trajectory for our project. And we went through a four-year sprint that was pretty good. We helped at least 2,700 families directly. On average, uh, we didn't do a randomized control trial, but it looked like post, pre, pre, post stuff said about $220 extra a month in families' pockets. But most importantly, we had 47 different organizations who were uh, businesses were involved, 28 NGOs, and four different levels of government local, regional, provincial, and national, and generated tons of what we would now call as niche innovations. Canada's first individual development savings program, headhunting service, services for working poor immigrants who don't have time to look for jobs in their field, and the list goes on. That went well enough uh, that we were asked to create the Tamarack Institute, and the Tamarack Institute was founded by Alan and Judy Broadman, uh, whose mission, family mission is we make money in the morning and we give it away in the afternoon. They're philanthropists out of Toronto, and they finance a whole bunch of initiatives, and their mission to us was watch communities trying to self-correct on complex issues, 
look for patterns and themes and feed that back to them because your job is to strengthen and embolden innovators and it is to make it easier for the early adopters to adopt practices that seem to be promising. So it's been a glorious mission and I give you that background because I want to tell you the stuff that we're about to share. Part of it we've experienced, I've experienced it, but mostly this is observations about what's going on and desperately trying to make sense of that in order to feed it back to, to change makers like you. So let me start with this first thing around why, and I want to begin with three reasons uh, why we should avoid place. <clears throat> and here are cases for why we should avoid place. And there's more than th these three, but here are three pretty big ones that are universal uh, across most of uh, North America, Europe, and Australasia, in my opinion. Number one, uh, one reason to stay away from place is the root causes of many of the issues the structural and systemic root causes of vulnerability in community or factors that influence well-being are well beyond the control of a community. Uh, I live in a province called Alberta, which is a heavy oil and gas province, an energy producing province, and there's certainly local issues related to oil and gas energy, but the dynamics of the oil and gas industry, uh, uh, the pressures around environmental sustainability, the collapse and fall and resurgence of markets, etc. All of those lie way outside of the province, never mind any one community. So the fact that you're saying, here are quality life issues and let's spend time in the community, lots of the leverage points don't exist within the community, so why would you bother? Number two, uh, depleted civic infrastructure. Actually, I'm gonna start with weak social capital. We know that social capital, which is the number of redundant trustful relationships between people, the real thing that we call community, trustful relationships has been depleted for quite some time in our communities for a whole bunch of reasons. Technology, urban and regional planning, uh, any number of different factors. And Robert Putnam was possibly one of the best social scientists in the 20th century, I guess 21st century as well, has done a better job than you ever could uh, documenting these things. And we know that social capital is one of the number one predictors and influencers of well-being, mortality, health, employment, income. The more trustful relationships you are, it translates into all those benefits. But these things are weakening, and they're weakening to an extent that uh, we actually don't have the kind of community oxygen required, the community infrastructure to deal with some of these things. Let me give you a quick example of this. <clears throat> in the mid-1990s, there was a huge heat wave in Chicago, which would probably be a mild summer day for you here in Brisbane. <laughs> but uh, there was uh, a high mortality rate of seniors who died. And the CDC came in and did a study about why that was, and they didn't find much, but a grad student sure did uh, from the University of Chicago. And they compared the social capital between North Lawndale versus South Lawndale. Uh, in North Lawndale, for a whole bunch of reasons that had to do with ethnocultural communities, urban design, etc., social capital was really high. So when someone, when the heat wave was up, someone would say, Where's Mary? How come I haven't, haven't seen Mary? Someone go check on Mary. I haven't seen her for a long time. She's got a really bad hip. I don't know if this is true story. But, uh, we, we, someone knows about Mary, right? Or kids are kicking over the fire hydrants and it's reducing water pressure for cold water to go up in those fourth and five story um, uh, walk ups. And someone already knows the causal loop, the systemic implication of what happens when you kick over a fire hydrant. So they stop kids from doing that. Uh, when, the, when police officers and fire department folks would knock on the door, someone's not scared Not scared to answer the door. They're in that kind of neighborhood where you would answer the door. South Lawndale, very low social capital, people scared to answer the door, no one knows about Mary, no one knows about fire hydrants, etc. All the things that abundant trustful relationships would give you, they don't have in South Lawndale. The mortality rate differs by a factor of 10. Right? So I'm not here to repeat some of that stuff, but you, when you go into communities, you know the difference between a socially capitalized community where they know each other and they have a sense of identity and where they don't. So that's been weakening for a whole bunch of stuff that's not easily within our control. The third reason to stay away from neighborhoods is civic infrastructure or what some people call organizational density. There is a general uh, rule when you're doing community development that if you go into a community that has the, a, a, a large number of diverse and locally valued institutions and institutional processes. School parent-teacher boards, uh, spontaneous uh, soccer, you know, uh, football clubs, uh, recreation, social, five different faith-based organizations, etc. The more dense, diverse, and locally valued, the way easier it is to get anything done. 
think about it as a civil servant going into those communities. You can talk to someone. They know how to represent. They know how to get stuff done. Go into a community that doesn't have those things. You're going to spend a lot of time wondering who you're even talking to and whether you have any license or legitimacy to do anything. We did this once in a, uh, a neighborhood change initiatives in British Columbia in a town called Surrey, right on the outskirts of a bridge. And when I did the mapping of civic density, we had, I called it 1.5 institutions. Someone who took care of the gym and a parent teacher, uh, a parent teacher group that met a couple of times a year. You know how hard it was to organize anything in that neighborhood, extraordinarily hard. So you look at the face of this and you'd say, stay away, let's manage things from the center. Three reasons we should stay away from community. Well, there's at least six reasons why we can't. Uh, and I'm going to begin with the first one. Complex issues that we're trying to deal with may have some universal patterns and themes, but almost all complex issues are context sensitive. They manifest themselves very, very different in different places. And these nuances are important about the group causes and the things that we can deal, how we can deal with them. And they're extraordinarily, uh, they make a big difference in terms of what kind of outcomes we can expect. So I think you may, you, you know that intuitively. I've heard that you have something like 55 watershed planning areas in Australia, where the watersheds are different and they need to be managed different. I can imagine you have different communities where you'd say, you can organize around this like this in community X, neighborhood X, but you can't do that in neighborhood Y. Why? Because context matters. Here's a little formula for you that if there was a Nobel Prize for social change, they would win it. Uh, it's Pawson and Tilly, who are two evaluators from the UK, who've got a phrase called C plus M equals O. Context plus mechanism equals outcomes. You put the same mechanism, a policy, a program, a way of doing things in a different context, <coughs> you're going to get different outcomes. You watch communities uh, who people come in from the outside and use different, the same mechanism in different contexts, you almost always see drift. The mechanisms start to change. So it's roughly that mechanism, kind of done in the way that suits context Y and kind of gives us outcomes Y. Context X plus mechanism X equals outcome X. We are always customizing things to work well in different contexts. And if any of you have ever done international development work, you think it's the same doing business in Brisbane as it is in Tokyo, it's different. Context matters. So if you're working from a distance, you can't see this context. And even if you could, your urge to come up with standardized responses to complex and varied problems is so strong that we almost default to cookie cutter designs. We need to pay attention to context in place. Untapped local resources. As powerful as the center is, with the volume of taxable resources that uh, we can amass and deploy in surgical, if not clumsy ways on complex issues, uh, there is in some ways even more untapped, if not smaller resources that local communities can pull out as well. Uh, and local knowledge about how to use those resources. Quick little example from Chicago. <clears throat> there is a medical clinic there that is state run uh, that for quite some time was managed by people from outside the neighborhood. And the local neighborhoods were saying, I like that government facility, but it's actually not as responsive to our needs and it doesn't seem to be generating the kind of outcomes we want. <coughs> we're going to do what they call in America, capturing the board. I don't know if you use that language here, but they mobilized, they got on the board, and residents ran the place. Realized that simply sitting on the board didn't make much difference. What you had to do was to untap local ingenuity partnerships and resources. They actually, uh, in the very first year, pulled out the seven things that were putting the most pressure on the emergency rooms in that local clinic. Number seven was dog bites, uh, vagrant dogs. Not a big neighborhood, but a real issue. So they did a root cause analysis, and they found that the root cause of dog bites was dogs. <laughs> <laughs> big thing. Couldn't, Center for Disease Control couldn't figure that out. So they weren't going to do anything about it, but you could untap local knowledge. So they worked together with a local entrepreneur group that helped kids start businesses, the local SPCA, a local parent group, and they created a little business for kids who would go find uh, these dogs and they would deal with them safe and they bring them into the SPCA and they had pet adoption programs and all this kind of stuff and they created a whole row of programs and services that were really youth development and orientation but also within six months dramatically reduced the pressure in the emergency room around dogs. We have paid officials, doctors and nurses in there before, 
They didn't have those resources and those social networks. The second thing that was the most, uh, or the fourth thing that was the most uh, pressing on the list of seven was traffic uh, accidents in certain parts of the neighborhood. Went to the local municipality and they actually didn't have the GIS system at the time where they could find out in a more microcosmic sort of way where those accidents were. So the residents, not only did they watch it in time, they went through all the files and with little blue dots and red dots, did a splatter analysis and found out where the accidents were and started to organize around how they could deal with that, including one uh, section which was simply, uh, well, I'm gonna, this is not gonna translate from, uh, to uh, Australia, because you guys drive so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Some version of, couldn't make a right hand turn uh, very well and they didn't have the proper light for that. They simply organized and put the lights on there, even including doing prototypes about what the light would look like so the city would get their act together. And if someone said, as long as you wear a yellow vest, you can break any kind of law you want. <laughs> uh, and they did that, lights went up, boom, accidents went down there. Then they started to organize around another set, a set of high incidence uh, uh, arenas for accidents because the uh, suburbanites were zipping through the interstate at a million miles an hour to get to their jobs and didn't actually have a sense of responsibility to the local neighborhood and organized to put speed bumps in those areas to slow down traffic and accidents went down there. Boom, all these resources were available to us before, but resident-driven control on tapping local knowledge of resources uh, led to changes. The, the last part of this vignette that I find interesting is the second most important thing, I think it was the second or third, was people uh, struggling with medical ailments from bad diets. So what they did is to say, well, let's particularly lower, lower income residents who were involved in a food desert. And we don't, do you guys have food deserts in Australia the same way that the states do? Have you used that frame, food desert? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't actually get fresh, accessible food except for convenience stores within a, an, an appropriate range. So that there's food there, but good food. Uh, so they, particularly in the inner cities, uh, started to work on this and they created community gardens on the walk-ups of brownstones and four to six story apartments. Not only did they start generating food with these market gardens, but it became a place of social capital formation again. People started going there, little kids who had already got rid of all the dogs. There was even a problem because they started stealing people's dogs. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's still stuff to manage there. And they started, they said, get those kids working on the garden. So they created market gardens. Seniors came in to mentor them because a lot of kids didn't grow up in a gardening environment and the seniors had to show them. So they had senior youth mentoring. It was like a Swiss army knife enterprise. And for centralized agencies, which I am, who only sometimes can muster powerful single purpose instruments, the whole Swiss army knife kind of possibility is extraordinarily difficult to do, but not so much for local communities. So there's endless stories like this. You all have these stories, but the ability to be lo uh, untapped local resources is a big one. Greater innovation potential. I, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time telling stories on this. Who, as a rule, general rule, thinks it's probably easier to take small scale risks and make mistakes and use a trial and error approach at the community versus central government? Mm -hmm. We all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean you don't suffer from those mistakes, but there is greater innovation <coughs> potential on the ground than there is in the central agency, so I'm not going to use my scarce time telling those stories. <coughs> but I do want to confirm that there is a much grander ability to integrate vocal responses at the local level than the central level. Things are joined up. We all know that. We've talked about joined up government for quite some time. But when things are joined up at this level of scale, it is so very difficult to, in a Frankensteinian sort of way, bolt responses together that are meaningful and elegant for people on the ground. But you can do that at the local level. The interdependency of these complex issues is manageable. You can see that they're not abstract. They're real. You try stuff. You get real-time feedback. Uh, you know how to manage these things much better. No better example that, than that in the north end of Winnipeg, which used to be the <coughs> immigrant uh, settlement point for hundreds of thousands of East Europeans coming to uh, Canada in the 19th century, and before that, a meeting place for indigenous people for three or 400 years that we have recorded history of. Uh, and that place became a depleted, forgotten neighborhood. The North End Renewal Corporation was committed to a comprehensive renewal program for that neighborhood and uh, did a, employed an approach that they called strategic drivers or strategic platforms. And the idea they use there is we will always start 
with a powerful single purpose intervention. And then in a modular way, we are going to relentlessly, relentlessly link on new platforms and chunks over time. We're not going to be comprehensive from the outset. We're going to grow comprehensively over time. So the first thing they do is they say, we have to rebuild these neighborhoods, these, uh, these buildings which are depleted, some of which are burned through gang wars, uh, and we also have to uh, uh, improve the utility uh, energy savings on these things. So how are we going to do that? They found a tremendously generous federal program to do it, and then they said, let's just not splatter these upgrades throughout the neighborhood. Let's put them together on a single block and do it block by block. And I said, we're going to retake our neighborhood block by block. And the reason we're going to do that is we want to show demonstrable wins, but we also want to show people that we can build community together and give that neighborhood a sense of social capital. In almost every block by block enterprise or a, a campaign that they run, rebuilding houses in that block, a community garden got started, a homework club, some kind of uh, 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 block parent club, etc. They created social capital, or at least will be together a little more strongly at the neighborhood level. Then they said, hey, we're doing so much construction here. Why don't we ask the local businesses to be the suppliers of the resources? Local businesses did. Hey, why don't we ask the local tradespeople to do the work so it doesn't come from outside the neighborhood? Local businesses did. See the economic increase there? Then they said, hey, how about some of the vulnerable people who are leaving prison for having burned these homes in the first place who are coming back into this uh, system and actually have very weak economic prospects? Uh, they did. They, created, they asked the businesses to hire them. They wouldn't. So they created a social enterprise called uh, something by Bros, B-R-O-S. And they are now the primary driver of the, uh, the, the renewal of the neighborhood around housing development. That story goes on and on and on. So okay, the elegance of weaving that together relatively quickly in a seamless way, you can't do that from the central line agency. It's just not those possibilities aren't afforded to us. Last two things, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> Long-term resilience. We once went into a neighborhood program called Action for Neighborhood Change, and I had just had a car accident, so I was lying on the ground participating in a national conference call with five central agencies. We were asked to be the technical assistance intermediary, and they said, we're going in there for three years, we're going to change neighborhoods, and here's all the things we're going to do. And the, the only thing I could muster was, heaven help the neighborhoods we come visit. Because we're going to be busy, we're going to get stuff done, we're going to write reports, we're going to take photographs, we're going to write reports. They may or may not even know that we were there. <laughs> right? Yeah, they may not know, but we're going to get our stuff done, and in the worst case scenario, we are going to overwhelm them and deplete them even further and get them more frustrated uh, because they probably have been through this before. So this was my profound worry going in. Now, I will say that it didn't, wasn't my profound worry going out because we anchored, we, we developed partnership with anchored institutions and we said, we're going to be fair weather people. We're coming in for three years, we're going to leave, and as the tide of our intervention leaves, something's going to be left on the beach. You import us on your terms. You import us so you leave your community more confident, stronger than when we came in, but you have to manage us. We're not going to be able to manage ourselves. So that part worked out well, but the part that thrilled me most of this story was one of the neighborhoods, North Central Regina, was declared the day before I got there for a technical assistance gig, the worst, no, the week before, the worst neighborhood in Canada by our national magazine called McLean's. So it's like Time Magazine. And they had scorecards, vulnerability index, and they were the worst neighborhood. So I went in thinking, this is going to be gruesome. How depressing is this going to be? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have to do cheerleading and all that stuff. And I, as I got closer, the cab to the community center, there was balloons, there was rock and roll playing, uh, there was a party, there was a barbecue, and I walked in and they had huge banners and t-shirts, we're number one. <laughs> right? North Central Regina, keeping the suburbs safe. Uh, just on and on and on. And that is just emblematic of stick to itness that us with our ADD coming in and out, sometimes flaky, sometimes serious, but clearly never everlasting, doesn't compare to someone who says, I live here, this is my community, I'm going to make it work. The last reason to pay attention to this is a little less instrumental and more of a, a value based statement. Uh, and there's a phrase in the Polish Constitution, and I know all of you know this, it's just from the one from 1547. <laughs> <laughs> so, nic o nas bez nas. Nothing about us without us. 
And if we live in a democracy, we ebb and flow about how seriously we take that statement, but in a world where we all talk about community engagement, and Australia was one of the countries that did the most on this. When we started Tamarack, most of the stuff we saw that was codified came from Australia. We have to live that, right? In the same way in Canada, we have to live out the principle of reconciliation and meaningful engagement. This is an opportunity to relive that. If we want to re-engage citizens and make people more than consumers and taxpayers, uh, which I resent those terms to no end. I'm not a consumer, I'm not a taxpayer, I'm a human being who's also a citizen. This is an opportunity to do that. I spent a lot of time on this, three reasons to avoid it and six reasons why we can't. And I want to say that it leaves us with a wicked question. How can we take advantage of all the place-based, uh, of all the benefits, sorry, of place-based approaches to make progress on a complex issue? Well, the, the capacity for community-driven change is uneven. Many of the factors that affect the well-being of place are outside of local control. That is the wicked question we have to answer because, as we noted this morning in another conversation, sometimes you don't need to go play to place. If we're distributing benefits online to people, social welfare benefits, you can do that by computer. There's not a lot of a place-based dimension. Some of these issues are unavoidably place-based, and it is not either or. It's weaving together central agencies and place-based enterprises together that will move the issues on complex issues. Neither one of us alone, uh, neither approach alone, is going to have much hope. So with that in mind, let's come to this issue of collective impact. And uh, is it, you know Rich Hardwood? You guys walk around with Rich Hardwood stuff? Uh, He's got a partner who uh, is actually from Canada, and she did a real nice thing for us when she was talking about the history of place-based approaches, and she used the spiral. And I don't have the spiral, so I didn't want to make it up again, about our ebb and flow in the last 80 years around place. Interested in place, let's do war on poverty, community development corporations, and grassroots effort. Kind of got tired of place, let's talk about service reform. Mm -hmm. Next round, let's talk about collaborative place-based service integration. Get kind of tired of that. Let's talk about systems reform. It's always moved from central to place-based historically, and in the year 2011, John Kanye and Mark Kramer simply framed in a way that no one else could, uh, or could and did as well, collective impact, which is simply the latest iteration of what it means to, to think about place at a scale that shocked some people in its ambition by saying there's lots of place-based stuff ha that happened before, but what we are seeing emerging is people who want to use place to actually move the needle on complex issues. Before it was around collaboration of place, now we're talking about collective impact of place. That simple article written by well-framed uh, well, outside observers who gave legitimacy and framed it the right time in the right way really was a tipping point because it engendered so many people who either said, I was doing that and I didn't know, or number two, I like that and <coughs> let me organize ourselves to work that way. So this uh, approach is uh, simply the latest in how we're going to do this, and I want to say a couple of things about it and how you evaluate it, but I want to say this. It's not going to be around forever, this phrase in this way. It's just the latest part of the spiral that is not going to go away. We're, we're, we're going to do it. It doesn't matter when, if and when the spiral moves back. If it comes back, it'll be based on collective impact, uh, impact the next iteration. This is simply the way we deal with things. And right now, the spotlight is uh, large on this. And we're going to take advantage of it. And we're going to make as many lurches forward, lurch forwards as we can. Who's seen this collective impact stuff before? Just a quick show of hands, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You get the general idea, right? Collective impact, their framing of it was, we've got tons of isolated impact, different organizations doing different things on their own, getting very good programmatic results. But just like the story I told you in Waterloo, not enough to cumulatively move the needle on anything. People work in their own things in their own ways. Funders fund specific programs. And scale is all about build a really big thing that works. Even when we have been able to scale, which our record is extraordinarily bad, Right? Gives up to humans and we're sure to screw it up. Uh, we have been able to move the needle on things. Needles are not moved by programmatic interventions alone. So what they said is, how can we get alignment? And they talked about five different shifts. Let's move from specialized agendas to common agendas. Let's move from fragmented measurement systems, where we all measure one part of the challenge and how we're doing, to shared measurement systems. Let's shift from independent activities to 
mutually reinforcing activities from sporadic communication to continuous and unsupported, unsupported efforts to acknowledging that this stuff doesn't happen well at the side of our desks. Collective impact efforts or any community change efforts require almost like a general contractor for change. As the specialists, plumbers, and electricians come and go, someone's got to pay attention to the whole building and make sure the thing moves along. Community developers have known this forever. We've known a lot of this stuff forever, but as one of the greatest collective impact practitioners who's not that heralded, Jay Connor said, thank goodness for FSG because they frame such things in such a way that those of us who are doing the work can actually get on and do the work and not keep explaining it. Now, there's widespread buying and there are early results. In Canada, we're seeing it in teen pregnancy, health, education, poverty, community safety, and homelessness. Teen pregnancy in Tillamook County used a collective impact effort before we even called collective impact, had the second highest rate teen pregnancy rate in all of Oregon, used collective impact-ish type processes, and eight to nine years later reduced teen pregnancy by 75%, 75 or 80%. Health, there's collective impact efforts, education, poverty, community safety, and homelessness. I'll show you right away that Canada has uh, Medicine Hat, which is the first community in North America to have formally declared they've ended chronic homelessness. If you were homeless in Medicine Hat, within seven days you were housed. So, it is possible, but as we're about to see, we are still at the point where these efforts are outliers and heroic. They're not the mainstream, it doesn't mean they can't be. But as we have done this, we actually have some real emerging frustration in our field, and I want to normalize this because a lot of us are feeling it in different ways, and as my wife would say, we have to get over ourselves. There is frustration growing already. We can see a bit of a snapback going on. Unmet expectations about the pace and scale of change. How come you haven't solved this yet? Number one. Number two, a sense of rigidity in the collective impact framework. How can they frame it as this? And what about equity? They haven't included equity. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things that are imperfect about that framework. Number three, feeling that the CI approach is not the only approach around. We want to make community change, and we've cannibalized everything else we're doing simply to support this collective impact agenda. What about traditional stuff, community organizing and policy change, etc.? Some people believe it's been pitched in such a way that it's mutually exclusive. Well, here is what we were facing at the Tamarack Institute. And I got a bit panicky with Liz, who I wrote this with, and saying, we better get on top of this, because if this is yet another fad, uh, we're going to snap back too soon, and we're going to miss all the benefits of this framework, because it is roughly right, the collective impact of approach to place-based change. The why of place-based is clear. The collective impact is roughly right. It's got good bones. It's simply incomplete, imperfect, and uh, insufficient by its own to make change. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. But it is directionally correct. There's a phrase in Canada from a Canadian author that says, uh, how are things going? And the answer is, we're clumsily off in the right direction. <laughs> and I, I believe that about collective impact. Here's where we are. We are clearly at the phase of collective impact, still absolutely in the frame of the innovators. Innovators need to know why, and they want a little bit of how, but they get irritated if you tell them how, because they simply want to build the practice themselves and invent and create. That is what an innovator is. An early adopter wants the why to be clear, but they also want something to adopt. You agree with that? Show me how to do it. I get collected at that. Bought it. Drank the Kool-Aid. How do you do it? How do you do it? I want something to adopt. Late adopters early majority, actually say, I get the why, I like the it, but I also want the ecosystem in which I apply this work to be seamless. I don't want to have to deal with uh, Regulation X, and how can we're doing this, and we're supposed to report on this? And how can you tell me to work long term and you give me an 18 month funding cycle, right? They don't like, they're irritated by the ecosystem not making it easy to adopt. These are all important things, but here's the challenge. We are still innovating. And if we hurry up and codify and step, start telling people this is predictable, we are going to so short, short circuit collective impact simply to please all of those who need certainty and codification. Early adopters, too demanding, too early, will completely short circuit innovation. And we ain't there yet because the original CI model still has a lot of work to do and it needs to be invented by people like Logan and people like you. We ain't done, we're not out of this phase. We better hurry up though and start documenting and making our practice coherent because there are early adopters who are waiting for us. 
Now, is that a bad problem? Well, who's got a iPhone 1.0? Not many of you. Who's got a 2.0? Where the hell are we anyways with iPhones? I don't have an iPhone. Ten. Are we at 10? <clears throat> so was the iPhone 1 a complete disaster? Nope. Did we, need the, did we need the 1 before we got to 2? Yep. Did we need a 2 before we got to 3? We sure did. We're in early days. We're still building collective impact 1.1, 1.2, 2.0, 3.0. .0. And this is the argument we made. We're almost there for over half, halfway. We wrote this article at the Tamarack Institute to use what little voice and leverage we had to essentially say, as my wife said, let's get over ourselves. This is a roughly right framework. 1.0, we were doing it, we didn't know. 2.0, we started paying attention. 3.0, we got to get serious about documenting practice and generating ever bigger results. And here is our version of 3.0, which I'm going to go over fairly quickly. And as I noted in a presentation in Philadelphia last month, I'm not even sure I 100% believe this anymore. <laughs> How's that for selling your own article? <laughs> I have my favorite philosopher, Bertrand Russell, who says, I'm not willing to die for my beliefs because I'm probably wrong. Uh, <laughs> or I might be wrong. I, the point we were trying to make is, we think it could be better framed, and there's new things that could be added. We are going to continue to evolve. You continue to evolve. We all have to build the next iPhone around collective impact. We all have to work. Don't disempower ourselves by saying, Kanye and Kramer developed this thing, and it's orthodoxy now. It's a best practice. Best practice is, by definition, anti-innovation. By definition, it's anti-innovation. Because it says, here's the practice. Implement it. We don't have a best practice. We have a promising practice, a compelling practice. And here's the other thing about evidence. Evidence on innovation is always ahead of the evidence curve. Uh, innovation is. Innovation is way ahead of the evidence curve. We have to innovate and then ultimately see if it's going to work. So we are clearly in early days, and here was our version to stimulate the field to say, here's what we think, what do you think? And I'm not going to go over this in a lot of detail because I want to talk about measurement, but here, uh, summer, uh, summary, we said, if we're doing collective impact, we think a feature is talking about moving from a management paradigm to a movement building paradigm. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Management paradigm says you get 40 people around a leadership round table, they can manage and steward the system in a way that's more efficient and will get outcomes. <clears throat> Forty of the most powerful, best intentioned people in the world can't shift the community. They can make a big difference, but movements can build communities. Movements about making change and Logan, etc., shift the ground under which everyday management is played. Uh, can you get people in, in the water supply? Logan can be better. We can move the needles on this. Here's how we can all be involved. Management by net definition, it, there's a great phrase, managers, and I've often been in management, would rather live with a problem they can't solve than a solution that they don't control. <laughs> that makes sense to you? Management is by definition a conservative act. The system is roughly right, tweak it, but if the system needs reform or transformation, managers aren't good at that space. So we need movement building. We need to create movement that creates the ground for everyday managers and leaders to do things that they couldn't do before. So we, that was our contribution. Number two, community agenda, common agenda versus community vision and aspiration. There's lots of ways of developing community agendas that have, let's move the needle on this and let's move the needle on that. But if you have an aspiration like Hamilton did called the best place to raise a child, and you link it up to movement building, you can do what Hamilton, Hamilton did. Every councillor as their number one priority when they went for the election. When Hamilton was asked to build a beautiful stadium for football or do poverty reduction, 84% of Hamiltonians said poverty reduction is number one. That's movement building, that's vision. Shared measurement, uh, we'll get into this another time because people think about evaluation, strategic learning, and have the same reaction as colonoscopy or root canal, uh, root canal. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, there's lots of shared measurement. These initiatives, which are living, breathing things, require strategic learning. What kind of outcomes are we getting? What are we learning about the nature of the problem? What are we learning about what does and does not work? And what are we learning about our own limitations and capacities as change makers? We we are going to learn our way through this. Thinking by, uh, learning by doing, thinking with our hands. We need strategic learning, not just measurement. Mutually reinforcing activities, I love this one. Mutually reinforcing, sure, but the real issue is, are we working on things that have high leverage? 
And I see that you had that in some of your discussions around Logan. I saw some earlier documents around this. A lot of people work on, on service integration as a mutually reinforcing activities. I'm going to maybe blow, I don't think I'll blow your mind. I already realized I should have said that. I'm going to tell you something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the research that we've seen on service integration is service integration is incredibly hard to do. It takes up a lot of energy, it's extraordinarily grinding, and it can, if done well, over time with a lot of resources, improve access and ease of services and improve the ability to get multiple service relatively quickly. There is, as, as of yet, no compelling evidence that it transforms outcomes for children and families. A lot of research on this, and I'm not saying don't do it. It's a necessary part of the change. It isn't necessarily isn't the transformational driver. And it does mean that just because it's convenient, we can mutually work on that together, it doesn't mean it's high leverage. Uh, when we've seen high leverage stuff, it's an example of this. When we were doing poverty reduction and trying to improve employment and incomes, I got seven, eight more minutes, eh? Before we get into chat, sorry folks, I'm doing my own time check here. Uh, <clears throat> tell me about this thing, uh, 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 compare this. A fellow who is part of our leadership round table in Aqua 2000, uh, runs a big high-tech company. He gives us money for the leadership roundtable, and he engages his uh, his crowd. It's called business to business engagement. We would never talk to business people. Business people talk to business people. Government people talk to government people. They already they saw us coming a million miles away. So we would have business people deliver the message, and he takes ten friends up north, I'm gonna tell you a good old boy story, to go hunting for moose in Northern Ontario. He's at their cabin, they have a good time. He does this all for OP2000. Flying back, and as they're sitting in the plane, he says, look, I'm working with this poverty reduction collective impact effort. I want to show you a list of people. Here's the money they were making when they were on welfare, and here's the money now that they're working. But coded names, etc., but pre-post. And someone said, Rick, you're doing a tremendous job. But listen, uh, they're not doing that much better. <coughs> on on uh, working than they were on welfare. And when we look at the benefit sheet, they actually lost a lot of, lost a lot of benefits from working. You're gonna have to work a lot more with this collective impact bunch because they 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 got a good start, but it's a terrible finish. She goes, oh, that's exactly what I'm doing. I've done the research and they're all working in your companies. <laughs> <laughs> they launched a book called The 10 Things Your Company Can Do to Build Your Business and Reduce Poverty. We sold 2,000 copies within three weeks, not sold, gave it away. And we were getting people coming in saying, I did the self-assessment about uh, poverty rates. I changed the, in the, the wages for 27 positions in my company. So, is that high leverage? Way leverage. Anyone work in employment development, you know how long it takes to generate wage increases like that in conventional program and initiatives? High leverage is what we're looking for. And if it's nice, if it's mutually reinforcing, all the better. Hmm. Authentic engagement. Uh, and container for change. Uh, let me just, authentic engagement, let's pretend we had a nice chat about that. <laughs> we don't have time to do a good job. <laughs> so I want to talk about, uh, it means more than communication. You can't just communicate with residents. You engage them in meaningful ways. They have to shape not endure their future, and we know a lot about that, so we wanted to reinforce that. That was the biggest criticism against collective impact. Mm -hmm. Finally, container for change. I think that using the phrase backbone inadvertently misses 75% of the magic of collective impact. Backbone suggests someone puts together the meetings and facilitates sessions and comes up with plans, and that's all important. That's the outer work of backbone work. The real work is how do you create a container for change where leaders have some kind of internal transformation about what the nature of the challenge is and how they are complicit and, and also part of the solution around systems change. That example I gave you of Rick Brock, that didn't happen out of the blue. That happened because someone was curating a change process, had opportunities for Rick to connect with people that he wouldn't have connected with before, had insight and empathy into the nature of the problems, to get involved in action learning. Rick, like many of the Leadership Roundtable members and the community members, were curated around a change process. They went through some internal transformation. And I'm a repressed East European immigrant guy. I don't talk about this stuff easy, but every time you've seen something beautiful happen in collective impact, transformational, it's because someone was curating a change process. The plans, that's all the exterior stuff. You can't, I can't tell what's going on by looking at plans. I can get a sense of it. 
you can tell when you go to these meetings and you watch how the networks are lagging. Is there a container for change? Deeper insight and empathy into the problem, stronger connections, and greater confidence and commitment to act, even when that act is going to create frictions in the systems that they manage. That's a tough thing to, uh, to, to, to tackle. And when we wrote this paper, we got pretty good feedback on it. The one that got the most uneven feedback was this comment, and I take responsibility for not framing it even better, and it's the one I'm the most convinced about in this document. So, how's your energy? Ready? One last <coughs> lurch? Okay. The challenge of evaluating results. I just said, make, tried to make a point that the why is abundantly clear, it's the how we have to address. In the same way that Robert Putnam wrote a book called Better Together, where he said, here's the importance of social capital, here's all the reasons we don't have it. We have a new 21st century agenda building on building social capital. We have to figure out how to build capital in communities that have to play the capital, because the old ways of doing it aren't working. The why is clear, the how is not. We have the same thing. Let's build collective impact and get ready for 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. Part of that success depends on us on evaluating results. And here's six uh, quick principles that we can use around evaluating results, which is one part of the strategic learning process and evaluation <laughs> process. It's much, much more than this, but here are things that at least we have seen as useful in community change efforts. Number one, when people don't understand something and it looks like the black box and they're desperately seeking coherence about what does an outcome look like, what does change look like, if we don't offer them something, they're gonna default into show me the numbers, what's the bottom line, even if they're not particularly sure what the bottom line is. And I did a workshop once called How to Snow People, Snow, uh, Fool Them, on what outcomes are and results. And I did it as a joke, and I can make a lot of money doing it, actually. <laughs> in fact, you just show people numbers and spread charts, and they go, oh, that's good. <laughs> like someone's doing something about this. And I actually think the job is we have to be, as part of our stewardship good work, be good at framing what an outcome is. Uh, so, we have to come up with what we would call, Jess is here, theories of change, results, frameworks, etc., that add coherency to the process. And I'm going to give you a real quick example of this with the Energy Futures Lab in Alberta. We have an Energy Future, uh, anyone in Alberta? Oil and gas? Uh, a bit of Minnesota with Texas, Montana, and Colorado. Right? Four and a half million people, 4.2 million people, oil and gas. We make a lot of money for oil and gas. Our GDP is 50% higher than anyone. It's the Alberta tar sands, the oil sands. There's two narratives in Alberta around energy transition, and we're suffering. We have so much polarization. It's drill, baby, drill, or keep it in the ground. None of those polar things is helpful. We ain't moving with those things. You can't, you can't negotiate anything with such rapid polarization. And when people look at the transition that all our energy transition needs to the future, there are so many pathways to go there, but we're frozen. It's left-wing King Kong and right-wing Godzilla, something called it, pounding each other on the head. And most of us are on the sidelines. So we said, we have to create a radical middle. The middle is now radical, certainly in the United States, and in Alberta it is on the energy transition. So what did they say their change framework was on the transition? Now, this is a pretty Baroque diagram, but let me simplify it for you. It says, we're going to get change where the outcome is on the tail end, energy transition, with three kinds of outcomes. Number one, we have to change the cultural narrative landscape that is Alberta. Just because Alberta has a frontier landscape doesn't mean it's either drill, baby, drill, or keep it in the ground. And Alberta can be focused on transition. We can find common ground. We can weave together a frontier culture narrative that also says we're pioneers in environmental transition. You see that, the, the narrative game that people play? And we know that narratives define how we look at public policy issues. When uh, groups looked at uh, energy transitions and they did a, a little uh, randomized control trial with libertarians, they did uh, the, the two, uh, the, this little experiment. One group of libertarians, they said, we want to talk to you about climate change. And here's the evidence for climate change. And the implications for this are we have to uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions. We have to uh, expand the alternative fuel industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The next group, libertarians, they had the opposite angle. It was still the same content. But they said, we want to talk to you about the deregulation of the, of the alternative fuel industry. <laughs> Deregulation. So what does a libertarian do when they hear that? 
go for it, go for it, go for it. Right. <laughs> Boom, the trigger, immediately the framing, we got it. Went through all the same evidence at the very end, talked about global warming, six months follow up, those who were triggered with the deregulation word were dramatically 34 or 40% more likely to say there is a climate problem, we're part of the solution, we have to pay attention to oil and gas, uh, a carbon economy, and environment uh, alternative fuel industry is a central part of that thought. So we have to change the culture on that landscape and our vision is we can't do it alone. Our contribution is finding the 12 bellwether influencers in the oil and gas industry and the different constituencies, political conservatives and green to be polarized. And we are tr working with them, sometimes they don't even know it, influencing them and seeing if we can change their messaging because their constituencies and their social networks we know are gonna make a difference. Nudging systems, changing policies, uh, pushing for resource flows, are indeed certain areas, all the areas that we would call around system change, we don't even call it system change because it sounds like it has too much hubris. We nudge systems because the systems are big. And finally, niche innovations. The number, the variety of niche innovations coming out of this experimental platform that could not have been done by any other platform because it's so multi-sectoral, we have 60 fellows from oil companies, NGOs, First Nations, etc., where not only do we produce them, but we try and scale them out, so more people have them, scale them up with policy change, and scale them deep in a way that people love these innovations and they're not likely to go away over time. I'm not arguing for this, but I'm just saying someone explained the outcome framework for the Energy Futures Lab in this way, and I'm not gonna bore you through this, but now we can tell you about all the indicators and measures about why we think we're seeing progress in all those areas. Canada's leading oil and gas uh, uh, leader in Suncor Energy Foundation calls the Energy Future Lab a bellwether in the mess of the energy narratives in Canada. And if Canada's gonna survive, it's good because people adopt a radical middle position like the Energy Futures Lab. Did we have an influence on that? 100%. We influenced the critical bellwether in the Canadian industry. Nudging systems, all the way from nudging the business practices of a $5 billion oil and gas company to shaping the way the National Energy Board creates public policy around narratives. Tons of systems. And I'm only giving you a flavor, but there's 15 exemplar initiatives that are all coming out of the prototype phase, many of which have already been adopted. Now, if I just gave you data, you don't understand that data unless we framed what an outcome was. So, number one. Number two, Focus on evidence gaps. We don't have to keep proving everything in neighborhood change. Do we need a randomized controlled trial to say it's better to jump out of a plane with a parachute? <laughs> You're a tough crowd. I thought that was funny the first time. <laughs> you don't need it. Do you need to know, and someone challenged me on this, but let me tell the story anyways, that uh, kids who go to school hungry can't learn. Yeah. Right? So do we have to say our breakfast program has a longitudinal analysis, we followed these kids for 15 years, and uh, we did a randomized uh, pre-post, et cetera, et cetera, and yep, 4% more kids graduate from the kids who were able to eat program to the ones who were not. We don't have to do that. It's a dumb use of evaluation time. Let's consider that we don't have enough evaluation dollars to do this. What is the highest and best use of our time? Some things are self-evident. Let's draw upon obvious or evidence that already exists so we can focus on the areas we don't. We don't assemble evidence well enough. And as I noted earlier, I'm tired of reproving the, the case for place. I'm not doing it anymore. It's not productive. What kind of interventions work best in place? That's interesting. Number three, principle, no stories without numbers, no numbers without stories. Je where's Jess? Jess talks about this. Uh, Jess, Jess is one of, for sure, the leaders in the world around narrative building approaches to understanding complex issue with uh, most significant change being the one that I first uh, saw. Someone has to tell a story. What is the challenge we're trying to address? What was our strategy? They don't know what the problem was. What are the results? Why was it significant? And uh, uh, where do we go from here? So Jess, if I can draw on you to answer the one little example you gave me on the plane last night. Going to a meeting. Oh yes. Okay, so I'm in India, um, I collect a story from a lady who's sitting under a tree, it's hot, it took me two hours for the translator, and, and I felt really disheartened because um, the story went, 
I went to a meeting and I sat there and I didn't say anything. And I thought, oh. So by the way, that's the story. That is a real, that was what was collected uh, through the many translations and attempts and lots of cups of tea. And I had walked a long way and it was very hot. And then I asked, I always follow up with the second question, which was, and why was that important to me? Why are you telling me this story? And she said to me, this is the first time a woman has ever been invited to a meeting in this village. Um, so it's a total breakthrough. And um, next time, next week, I'll talk. Yeah. So that's that. Well, it's enough to make you weak me about the significance of that. Just because you measure stuff doesn't mean anything. The significance, the meaning of it, we need to measure, not being anti-measure. The value in that story is significant. So when we measure stuff, we have to create a context of meaning for people. You can ask it as directly as Jess did about why was that significant. We have to do the sense making of results. The results don't speak for themselves. Uh, I won't give you an example, but I will give you an example of this. We did this in Toronto, uh, systems outcome in the 19, 2016, the City of Housing uh, Corporation, which is the biggest social housing landowner in North America, 40,000 units or something, and the Toronto Atmospheric Fund created a pilot to test retrofitting in seven towers. So just quite minor. They have some numbers there in terms of utility savings and all that kind of stuff, GHG emissions. For those people who like numbers, they go, oh, because they get a spreadsheet, et cetera, that's good. Uh, the significance is, oh, they've got 2,200 multi-residential buildings, right, uh, that require retrofitting since the 1970s. And if this pilot goes, it is going to have the biggest impact on retrofitting in North America of any program. And the contribution, getting back to how do you know that backbones create value, we asked them and they said, had this backbone group not engaged us, we wouldn't have done any of this. So there's a bit of a story, right, with some numbers. Okay. <clears throat> Last four things, and then we stop. Three things, focus on early exemplars. When we're looking for population level change, we actually have to demonstrate more than early wins. We have to evaluate and demonstrate, here are the kinds of changes that could happen and why they are significant. So, in the example of the housing first strategy in North America, which is if people are vulnerable, you don't make them go through graduated housing. You give them a house right away, and then they're better positioned to deal with their vulnerabilities. That's the housing first strategy. What these groups did early on in the process is they told stories saying, we're not going to tell you population level outcomes yet because we can't get it. But here's the nature of the problem. Do you want us to prove concept on our strategy? We're going to tell you seven stories about people who did housing first. Here's Kevin. Here's Elaine. Boom, boom, boom. Elaine finally got into apartments. And uh, she struggled with drug addiction and mental health issues, etc. But whereas before she would have been on the streets and it would have been amplified, at least she was stabilized and able to do these things. Exemplars, early wins that demonstrate the bigger theory of change and the change you're trying to make. When it comes down to it, it was that approach that created enough social license for the 10-year plans to end homelessness to create these kinds of results. Calgary turned the curve. If they not done homelessness, they would have 8,000 people who were homeless in Calgary. Now they have a couple thousand, and they reduced the overall rate by 11%. And I've already told you what Ham Hamill uh, Medicine had did. They've ended product homelessness. And now, the mayor who started said, I didn't believe we could do it. Now they're saying they're going to do the same around poverty. Uh, elevate outcome learning as an outcome. And I'm just going to play you this, and if this may not work, so. Something that's, that should be celebrated. We especially learn from 
And so I'm going to send you the link to that. He goes on to challenge companies to do a failure report, and he says it's the biggest thing they've ever done to create a culture of failure. You, failure is endemic in collective impact. Just like uh, failure is endemic in cancer research, how many billions of dollars have we served made in cancer research, and sometimes get outcomes, but a lot of it doesn't get successful, but do we build on that and learn? Accountability is saying, we failed, we learned, we are learning by doing, here's what we learned, and we promise not to make that same mistake again. We'd like to move on to other mistakes, thank you very much. <laughs> right? Let's not repeating the ones made, because they're not lessons learned, they're lessons that haven't been learned. So rather than being slavish, and I didn't finish that sentence, to the original plan, high fidelity, your plan is an opening hunch, you fail forward, small bets before big bets, you learn stuff and you adapt. That is an outcome. Accountability is paying attention to data and paying attention to learning. The last thing, and then we're uh, opening it up, be realistic about managing expectations. 1990 to two, the year 2010, the Aspen Institute Roundtable on Community Change looked at 20 years of American investments into neighborhoods, distressed neighborhoods. And when Americans go into neighborhood renewal because of their philanthropic uh, tradition, they go hard. The Rebuilding Community Initiative by the Annie E. Casey Foundation focused on 10 communities over 10 years, and their evaluation budget, not their intervention budget, was, ready for this, 60 million. Yeah, that's the upside of being in the States, right? <laughs> no, honestly, they swing, they got more money than some small countries, those philanthropies. And they went for that, and that was the exception rather than the rule. Here's what 20 years later have said. We have seen clear systems change outcomes, lots of programmatic outcomes, lots of capacity building outcomes, but as of yet, uneven population level outcomes. Sometimes we hit them, but we haven't seen the scorecard across the board go. And they said, is this a strategy and implementation issue? Some of it is. It's also expectation failure. We said at the very beginning of this, place-based on its own isn't, can't do it. There are macroeconomic forces, public policy. If you're an American woman, do you know how long you get from that leave in the States? Nothing. How much community organizing is going to solve that problem? Right? At the, uh, is a neighborhood going to babysit for you for 12 months? Right? Are you going to organize a program to help people save money so they can hire a nanny for 12? Mm -hmm. Like, really, really. So, we have expectation problems of the highest order around place-based efforts. Place-based efforts are a powerful central tool, but they are complementary to top-down stuff, and their job is to play a part, but they can't win the game on their own. So we have lots of population-level outcomes, but we have to really manage expectation. We have some real bad habits about what we expect. Okay, <clears throat> it's a bit longer than I wanted trying to do the right thing by sharing, but also leaving a little bit of time for chat. I just went through six different principles that to think about and practices around talking about how to evaluate and demonstrate results in this area, but it was all based on the ver was a very simple argument. The why of place-based approaches is clear. The how continues to develop. The how depends on being even a little bit smarter around demonstrating evidence than we have before. Uh, and this is the best that we can see right now in this clumsily off in the right direction uh, use of collective impact. I, when I get tired and want to see more, I remind myself of a quote in the Torah, and I'm not Jewish, but uh, I have a Jewish buddy who's got such, I think I might become Jewish because the number of quotes from the Torah is just so mind-numbingly good. Uh, it is not for us to finish the task, but it surely is to begin it. We are in an area of grand self-correction. We are dealing with 21st century problems with 19th century machinery. Just at, like in the height of the second industrial revolution when we had anxiety all over the place, check the press, late 1880s, uh, faith-based organizations, old institutional patterns, we couldn't take care of ourselves. The outcomes were bad. There was anxiety levels that were quite high. We're seeing that now. But back then, that was also the time of the greatest social innovation. We had what we would now call the progressive movement in public administration. We have what we would now call corporate social responsibility. And we had actually the birth of the modern nonprofit sector. Red Cross, YMCA, United Ways, uh, all the animal clubs, like the elks and the lions and all of those <laughs> things. We are now at a time where our job is to invent. We don't know the outcome. We have to invent. And again, it's not for us to finish the task, but it surely is to begin. Thank you.
given um, and a lot of our Australia's interest in place-based response has actually been drawn from the UK because they've had such, mm -hmm. you know, dedicated place-based responses, you know, originally around deprivation and so forth. But they haven't bought into any of the collective impact language, at least not in a public policy sort of sense. What's your take on that? Um, that's a good question, actually. I, uh, I had a chat with someone about this. Do you know Jeff Mulgan from Nesta? Mm. Yeah, and so Jeff said that we were actually on a dock in a beautiful northern Ontario lake in Muskoka, and sitting right by Martin Short's house and Goldie Hawn's house across the river, and we were <laughs> feeling quite philosophical. And he said part of it was uh, it seemed a bit marketing oriented to kind of a more skeptical, palmy outlook on the world, so it seemed too clean and sharp and whatever. He said there was a cultural mistrust of that. And also, because of that huge push with the renewal effort they had with neighborhood, they had that big UK renewal effort, we kind of, that idea came alive on the downswing of interest and energy. And so if the interest in place bait had been on the ascendancy at that moment, and I think we're saying, you know, it ebbs and flows, it might have had a different reaction, but it was at least a combination of those two things where the Brits didn't pick it up. Uh, that's my understanding. And I, I think there's a lot of merit in that, and there's probably more than that. In fact, I would even say, how can we go into the English language world that, that really looks at this in this way? Written in English is one thing, but it doesn't culturally translate well. I, I know a lot about Poland and Eastern Europe. We don't talk about it there. Well, oh, come on, one or two more questions. Is it because they're already doing it? That's true, yeah. That, it could be. I mean, some places are, like the Europeans, the way they take care of cities and neighborhoods yeah. with public investment, that might be another thing that the, the sheer need for that may not be uh, the same. Although, hey, let's draw one more analogy here. Collective impact isn't all that big in New Zealand either. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, but it is big in the three places that have federal, provincial, and local governments. Federal estates, US, Canada, and uh, Australia, so there might be something related to that as well. But I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have to be universal for me. I look. I'm quite philosophical. The universe put this in front of us. It's helpful. Uh, I say collective impact if necessary, but not necessarily collective impact. We have multiple tools. If you're First Nations in Canada, Indigenous, collective impact's not enough. You want cumulative impact. You have to hit the streets and get rid of the Indian Act. Right? If you're in First Nations in Canada, you can't buy, you can't, you, you can't grow assets because the community owns your asset, which is great, but no one has been able to build an asset base, so they go into the city and have a credit record, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's vexing. Collective is not getting rid of the, the Indian Act. That's what it's called. You need hit in the streets and policy change. So collective impact is one part of a larger change agenda. It is an extraordinarily powerful thing. On its own, it's unrealistic to expect it to do much. And in fact. People will, this is why people got ripped in Canada. We were saying collective impacts to do it. Everything has to be channeled through that lens and the poor collective impact framework begins to shudder. <laughs> it, it can't handle all these crazy expectations. It's not an instrument designed to do that stuff. The collective impact doesn't do hardcore advocacy on policy change well. There's a gentle relational approach to advocacy, so it doesn't do it all well. And I think if we're change makers, it's called in France and in Quebec, bricoleur. You pull together whatever you have to get through the next phase of your journey. You tape things together. We're always weaving and ducking. And if it comes up with hybrid approaches, that's OK. We're rabid generalists. <laughs> um, kind of leading on from that, Nicole from Health, who just had to leave earlier, yes. Um, uh, her takeaway was very similar to what we're just talking about now. And in, in her uh, agency, um, where if collective impact is seen like that, uh, this kind of conversation here this afternoon has given her license to go, oh, it's collective impact ish. Yeah. Did you mean? And just by kind of going, it's collective impact kind of thing, it's not actually a rigid thing like this. Exactly. And the concept of constant innovation and that we're not going to pay by our numbers book, yeah. but that gives um, people some license to try some new things Absolutely. And, and to not be squashed by potentially other people. I'm glad you said that. I don't know if I said it in this thing, uh, but I'm a fallen Polish Catholic, and the phrase that uh, we use, you can't have heresy without orthodoxy. <laughs> right? So there is no orthodoxy yet. We're not even close to orthodoxy. We don't have the privilege of talking about orthodoxy. Uh, and I think the part of what we can do in Collective Impact 3.0 is 
you can have change labs and human-centered design. It's all a platform for making change. It's a Swiss army knife in terms of possibilities. So there's endless ways of being innovative with uh, collective impact methodologies. It's a, it's a big platform. I didn't satisfy her because she left the room. <laughs> if we don't stop talking now, Mark will not uh, get his plane, and we're worried that not only will the uh, screen roll up, but there'll be a trapdoor that I <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, In lieu of a speaking gift, we're going to make a small donation to a domestic violence charity in Logan by way of saying thank you to Mark. But would you please join with me in saying thank you, Mark? Uh, you have a precious thing in Logan going on, and it's going to require cocooning, right? Like taking care of. So take care of that thing. Uh, if for all those people who are looking for the next generation of collective impact, you have assembled some ingredients and a framework and a way of thinking that is going to teach the world a lot above and beyond uh, helping you guys move forward on things. So uh, yeah, take care of it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much.